Chapter Seven, Part Two of War Stories for My Grandchildren. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. War Stories for My Grandchildren by John Watson Foster. Chapter Seven, Part Two: The East Tennessee Campaign. Extract from Letter of October Twenty Fifth. I wrote you a few days ago, just as I was starting on a reconnaissance toward Bristol. We found no enemy, nor heard of any this side of Abington, Virginia, in any force. We had a very disagreeable march, raining most of the time, very hard on both men and horses. Our campaigning has been very hard and tiresome, though I have stood it myself very well, in fact, better than if we had had less active duty, but it has tried the mettle of our brigade. We have run our horses nearly down. A large number of the men are dismounted, and more than half of the rest have horses that will not stand a march of any length. The 65th came out with 850 men. They are now in camp about 600. The marching, rainstorms, short rations, and especially the whistling of bullets and ball have driven a number of our officers out of the service. But I fear the worst of our campaigning is yet to come. It is becoming a serious question how we are to sustain our army in East Tennessee this winter. There is enough bread and meat, but the men have no winter clothing, and unless it comes soon it cannot get over the mountains. Winter will soon be upon us, with muddy roads and swollen rivers. We have just started a train of wagons from our division over to Kentucky for clothing and supplies, but I do not expect to see it short of six weeks, if ever. We had been hoping to get railroad communication open by way of Chattanooga, but the disaster to Rosecrans has at least postponed that. Just now I am anxious to get over into North Carolina with my brigade, but military movements are very uncertain, and most likely I shall be disappointed. On the 29th of October I wrote again. General Shackerford had a report of the advance on us of an army of 18,000, and out of due precaution ordered us to fall back 18 miles, but this morning matters look as if we ran too soon from an invisible enemy. It will not surprise me if we are ordered back to our old camp at Jonesboro. It will suit me very well if we are, for I may then have a chance to make my contemplated raid over the mountains into North Carolina. I am anxious to get over there to see the people. The trip would take us through the Blue Ridge. I quote from a letter of November 1st. I wrote in my last how we got down here, how we ran from Sancho Panza's windmills, we are still here. We had orders to march, and were already an hour before daylight yesterday morning, when the orders came countermanding the marching. We were to go back to Jonesboro. We are having a delightful day, and a very quiet and most welcome Sabbath. I have been reading The Words and Minds of Jesus, and I got hold of an independent, which was quite a treat, as I don't often see any religious paper here. I went over to the house of Mr. Henderson, the leading citizen of this place and found he had quite a good religious library, plenty of Presbyterian works. I told him he appeared to be sound religiously, if not politically. He is considerable of a rebel. We have been enjoying our rest of late very much, and if we were not stirred out every little while with reports of large rebel forces right upon us, we could get more real enjoyment out of it. This evening a citizen, a reliable one, of course, reports the enemy advancing in force. Tomorrow, an equally reliable and intelligent one will know that there are none this side of the Holston River. If Willie were out here, he would see a great deal more about soldiering than he used to see at Henderson. In my letter of November 8th, I give an account of a bold dash of the rebels to Rogersville, which routed a Federal force stationed there and captured 404 guns. General Wilcox, who was in command in Upper Tennessee, when he got the report of the fight from the scared fugitives, became alarmed for fear the enemy would get in our rear, and he caused a general retreat of the whole army. Our cavalry and all marched all Friday night until late in the morning of Saturday, and abandoned the whole country for eighteen miles below Grinville, thus giving up all we had gained, and all without reason, for as it turned out, while we were marching all night one way, the rebels were retreating with their booty and prisoners the other. Where we will go next I do not know, but I hope right back and occupy the country clear up to the Virginia line. We can do it without difficulty. 
the whole cavalry force of burnside's army has been formed into a cavalry corps and placed in command of general shackleford the corps is composed of two divisions our brigade is in the second division it would be commanded by colonel carter if present but he may be absent for some weeks and i have been assigned to the command of this division it will be a very nice command and quite complimentary to me i may state that i remained in command of this division of cavalry during the remainder of my service in tennessee i extract from a letter of november thirteenth major brown and nine men of the sixty fifth are about leaving for recruiting service in indiana and i send this letter by him i told major brown that i did not know that i could say i wished as he that i too was going home but i could say with emphasis that i wished the war was over and that i was going home to return no more this going home to stay a week or two and then come back a tear away from home and all its dear attachments is worse than the first departure i can't say that when the campaign is pretty well over i may not apply for a leave of absence but when i think of the parting from home again and the long muddy winter ride across the mountains i begin to balance the matter when i come home i want it to be my last leave when shall that be i am too great a lover of my little wife my darling children and my happy home to make a good soldier at least a professional soldier how sweetly you wrote in your last letter of our little alice praying her evening prayers for her absent papa i believe he who noticeth the fall of a sparrow will hear and answer the prayer of innocence and childhood and bring me home in safety that i may be the guardian of our dear family my letter of november fourteenth reports an unfavorable change in the situation in east tennessee general bragg commanding the rebel forces in front of chattanooga feeling that he had rosecrans army safely besieged dispatched longstreet one of the ablest of the confederate generals with his army corps to capture or drive out burnside it is to that situation my letter refers the intelligence this afternoon from knoxville was rather ominous of evil to us general wilcox telegraphs to me that the enemy have forced the right bank of the river before loudon that general burnside had gone down to-day and that if the enemy were too strong for our forces there we would have to look out for a retreat to the gaps in the cumberland mountains our line of march would be to the cumberland gap and I am notified that I with my division will have the important work of guarding the approaches to this route, down the valleys of the Holston, Clinch, and Powell rivers, and also keeping open the communication with General Burnside on our right to Knoxville. We will know more definitely tonight or tomorrow. I hope and pray that we may not be driven to that dire necessity. In proportion as our joy was great in the occupation of this country, would our regrets be deep at being compelled to abandon it? but i have hope that tomorrow will bring the welcome intelligence that our army below has driven the enemy back over the river it would be with a sad and heavy heart that i turned my back upon the loyal people of east tennessee i have confidence that god does not will it so when my next letter november twenty second was written from tazewell on the route to the cumberland gap burnside had been besieged for a week by longstreet we are lying quiet here just out of hearing of the fighting that is raging at knoxville our messengers from knoxville report burnside holding out heroically i have little time to write and less inclination even to my dear wife i am heartsick and gloomy though not discouraged general burnside the best man of the generals i know and a gallant army have been beleaguered at knoxville for a week and are still fighting manfully we are almost powerless to do him any good but i have asked general wilcox to let me take my cavalry and support me at the fords of the clinch river with his infantry i would make at least one vigorous effort to break the rebel lines and raise the siege he is at the gap general burnside ordered him to look out for his line of retreat and at all events to hold cumberland gap this he is in a position to do i wrote from the twenty sixth from cumberland gap where i had come to try to get horses we have no news from general burnside direct since the twenty third when he said he could hold out ten days, that his position was a strong one, and we are hopeful of his success, for Grant at Chattanooga will push vigorously against Bragg. I will be off in the morning to harass the enemy. I shall make my headquarters at Taswell and send my old brigade over Clinch River toward Knoxville to stir up the enemy a little and try to divert them from Burnside. Our cavalry is in such wretched condition it is almost impossible to do anything. The horse is worn out, without shoes, and with very little forage. I regret it exceedingly when so much is expected of us, 
and needed. General Wilcox is ordered to keep his infantry near the gap and send my cavalry out toward the enemy to gather information and annoy them. I wrote again on the 29th when we had just heard of Grant's victory at Chattanooga, but were without information of the gallant defense of Fort Stevens and the bloody repulse of the rebels at Knoxville. We have no news except the glorious victory of Grant's army, and we are hoping to see its effect in the deliverance of Burnside. The enemy seek to starve him into a surrender. I sent out yesterday my old brigade to go down towards Knoxville and feel out the enemy. I am getting a little anxious about them, as there was cannonading heard below, and I have had nothing from them since they left. It would be a serious affair for me to have my own brigade captured. We are having rather a hard time to live, subsisting entirely upon the country. Our cavalry get along better than the infantry. The latter have been for days without flour or meal. Twenty-five cents have been refused for a cup full of corn. Parched corn is a luxury. But we are hoping for better times in a few days. The men bear it manfully. In my letter of December 4th, in acknowledging receipt of a late letter from my wife, I reply, I wish very much I could be at home to enjoy with you the entertainment you write about, but I shall have to forego all those pleasures, and live on cornbread and pork, cold nights, muddy roads, and occasional skirmishing. I don't know when I can promise you to come home, but not while the enemy is before us, as now. I think a few days hence we'll see them driven away. I mentioned in my last letter sending the 2nd Brigade down to the vicinity of Knoxville. They were attacked by the whole of Longstreet's cavalry and pressed back. They gave the enemy a severe fight, killing and wounding a considerable number of them. Our losses were a few taken prisoners, four killed and thirty wounded. Our men did bravely. My whole division will try it again tomorrow. We expect Sherman, who was sent up by Grant after his victory to relieve Burnside, will reach Knoxville tomorrow, when if Longstreet has not retreated there must be a severe battle. We want to be near at hand with our cavalry. I would have been there two or three days ago with my whole division, but we have been constantly held back by General Wilcox. Sometime before the siege of Knoxville, General Burnside had asked to be relieved of the command of the department, and General John G. Foster, of New Hampshire, of the Eastern Army, had been appointed to succeed him. He arrived at my headquarters while the siege was in progress. In this letter writing about a leave to come home, I refer to General Foster. If matters quiet down here, there is a probability that I may come home this winter, but nothing certain. A man in the Army can't go where he pleases. If General Burnside had remained, I think I would have had no difficulty, but it is uncertain as to General Foster, how strict he will be. I have been with him here for three or four days, being frequently consulted by him as to movements, the country, etc., and we have been quite intimate at his headquarters. He is quite a Yankee, and not so agreeable in his manners as Burnside, but withal he may make a good commander. But there is no man like Burnside for this department with his soldiers. I especially will regret his leaving. The day after I wrote my last letter, Longstreet retreated from Knoxville, December 5th, up the valley toward the Virginia line, and the next day, the 6th, General Sherman reached Knoxville. On December 10th I wrote, Bean Station, where we are now camped, you will find on most maps of Tennessee. It is ten miles from Morristown, on the road to Cumberland Gap, just at the foot of the Clinch Mountains, forty-two miles from Knoxville. We have followed the enemy this far up from Knoxville, from Tazewell, I joined the second brigade near Knoxville. Colonel Graham of that brigade reported that an encampment of the enemy was over the mountain about five miles, so I sent him over, had a skirmish, captured a captain, several prisoners, and seventy-five horses, and drove them clear over Clinch Mountain. Since then we have followed the enemy in their retreat, skirmishing with their rear guard all the way. I doubt whether we shall push the enemy much farther, as it will be difficult to get supplies." The siege of Knoxville was one of the most gallant events on the Federal side during the Civil War. Burnside, with an inferior force, successfully sustained a siege of twenty days, resisting the assaults of the enemy with comparatively small losses, endured short rations, and by the heroism of his command saved East Tennessee to the Union. The result gave great joy to all loyal men, and President Lincoln issued a proclamation calling on the people to render special homage to Almighty God for this great advancement of the national cause and Congress thanked Burnside and his army. General Grant, in his memoirs, says, The safety of Burnside's army, and the loyal people of East Tennessee, 
had been the subject of much anxiety to the president and he was telegraphing me daily almost hourly to remember burnside do something for burnside and other appeals of like tenor in my letter of december tenth i say burnside goes out of this department with the admiration of the whole army his defense of knoxville was glorious and his goodness of heart and purity of character endear him to all who know him years after while minister to mexico i visited washington at the time when burnside was a senator from his state and received from him much social attention and recognition of our army friendship from bean station i wrote again on december thirteenth we are still at this place from which i last wrote you being comparatively quiet we daily send out reconnaissances towards rogersville and morriston they generally meet the enemy nine and twelve miles out and have a pretty sharp skirmish lose a few men killed and wounded and then return to camp the enemy do not appear to be retreating or rather to have stopped retreating my health continues very good and i am in good spirits only i get quite homesick at times i will get home as soon as i can but the prospect for doing so is not very flattering in a hurried visit to knoxville i wrote on the twenty third of december as i got to thinking about home i said to general foster that when my services could be dispensed with i would like to take a leave of absence he says he cannot think of letting me go for ten days or two weeks but hopes at the expiration of that time that the exigencies of the service will permit him to let me go home that means i may probably go home if the enemy will let me don't fix your heart on my coming soon it will be as soon as i can consistently this is my christmas letter i can do nothing better to-night than to write you a letter by way of a christmas present we have to-day unexpectedly had a quiet if not a merry christmas though it did not appear last night as though it would be so about three p m yesterday i received orders in camp near blaine's crossroads to move over at once and join general sturgis at newmarket where the main body of the cavalry are we got off about sunset but did not arrive here till midnight having to ford the holston and travel over a very bad road how longingly i thought of what you and the dear ones at home might be doing at that hour as i marched along in the clear stinging cold night after the cold and cheerless ride we fortunately got into comfortable quarters and have been quiet to-day enjoying the rest and comfort we improvised a pretty good christmas dinner among the delicacies we don't get often we had eggs and butter we are not living in excellent epicurean style just now as the country is pretty well eaten out i cannot see any prospect of our getting into winter quarters such as the papers report the army of the potomac and of the cumberland are enjoying the climate of east tennessee is very similar to that of indiana and the men are very scantily supplied with dog or shelter tents and many have not even these to cover them my commands since we came into east tennessee have been on one continuous campaign without secession up the country over the mountains across the rivers down the valley then up again driving the enemy before us then falling back to drive the enemy up the valley again thus we have been for four months until we have run down our horses and about half our men but we are enduring it very well still after the rebels with as much zest as ever there's a vast deal of excitement in the cavalry service my last letter to my wife from east tennessee was written on the last day of eighteen sixty three which i began with a prayer let us not forget to thank our dear heavenly father for all his mercies of the past year oh how good he has been to us even with all our troubles how little we have done in our lives to repay that goodness may he make us more worthy of his mercies and blessings in the new year and may he preserve our lives that we may together meet and praise him to his watchful care i commit my dear wife and little ones i last wrote you from newmarket I was enjoying a quiet, rainy Sunday there, reading some good book I had found at a house where I was quartered, when about noon I received orders from my division to move forward and attack the enemy and drive him back from Mossy Creek. It was an unwelcome order, that rainy Sabbath, but we executed it, and after considerable skirmishing took up a new line two miles beyond Mossy Creek. Yesterday Colonel Wolford's division and mine were ordered out at three o'clock in the morning to Dandridge, where it was reported a division of rebel cavalry was encamped we went but found that the enemy had left the night before and we returned at four p m just in time to miss a nice little fight at mossy creek the enemy attacked our outposts at eleven a m and drove our troops back two miles but ours in turn drove them back again beyond our lines 
it is not often that my men have the fortune, or misfortune, to miss the fighting, as we did yesterday. We have here our entire force of cavalry, and one brigade of infantry. The rest of the army is at Strawberry Plains, and Blaine's Crossroads. Longstreet is reported at Morristown, with the main body of his army. I suppose General Foster intends to drive him away from there, if possible. How soon I don't care, because I want to come home as soon as the fighting here is over, and take a little rest with my dear wife and darling little girls. I may venture, before closing my East Tennessee correspondence, to give in part the last of these letters, as a specimen of letters to a soldier's child, written on January 1, 1864. Why should I not write a letter this New Year's Day to my dear little Alice? I am so far away I can't give you any nice present. All I can do is try to write you a good letter. What have you and Lily and the other children been doing today? And did you have a Christmas tree and a happy time then? Papa has not had much of a New Year's Day. It has been very cold, oh so very cold today. Was it cold at home? I could tell you a story about the cold. Would you like Papa to tell you a little story in his letter? Do you still like to hear stories? Well, I can tell you part of it, and Mamma can take over to you and fill it up. Papa, as you know, is away off, out in the mountains, so far away from home, in the army, and you know there are so many poor soldiers in the army. Yesterday, the last day of the old year, was such a gloomy day, it was so muddy and wet and rainy, and then last night it blew so hard and rained so much, it was like a hurricane. Get Mamma to tell you what that is. And the poor soldiers have no houses to live in, like little Alice, with nice warm beds, and they don't have large tents like you saw out in the woods near home last summer when Uncle Jimmy and the rest of the boys and men were out soldiering. They have to live in the fields and woods, and their tents are like Grandma's tablecloth, only smaller, and they stretch that up over a pole, and it opens at both ends, and at night two or three or four of them get down on their hands and knees and crawl into it and pull their blankets over them when they go to bed. The soldiers call them dog tents. Ask Lily if she thinks it would be good enough for her trip. Well, last night, after many of the soldiers had been marching in the rain, and when most of them were wet and their blankets were wet, they built large fires, but they wouldn't burn well because it was too wet, and they crawled into the dogs' tents and were trying to get to sleep when the naughty wind commenced to blow, and it began again to rain, and the rain would blow on their heads and they would draw them further into their tents, and then it would rain on their feet, and pretty soon there came up such a hurricane that it blew their tents clear off of them, and there they were, lying on the muddy ground, and the cold rain pouring down on them, and they all had to get up out of bed. It had rained so hard that it put all their fires nearly out, so they couldn't get warm. Poor soldiers! Don't you pity them? Some of the soldiers were out, away off in the dark woods on that terrible night, on picket. Get Willie or Uncle Alec to tell you what that is. And they had to sit all night on their poor horses, away out by themselves with their guns in their hands and swords by their sides, watching to keep the wicked rebels from slipping into camp in the dark night and killing your poor papa and the rest of the soldiers. After a while the rain stopped, but the wind kept blowing and whistling through the trees and over the mountains and making such a terrible noise. You can hear it whistle around the corner of Grandmama's house, but it moans and whistles so much louder here over the mountains. It might frighten little girls if they did not know what it was. So the wind began to change around toward the north where Jack Frost lives, and from where the white snow comes, and the rain began to freeze, and the ground got hard, and it was so cold, oh, bitter cold. The poor soldiers could sleep no more that night. Their blankets were all frozen stiff as an icicle, and they had to build great big fires to keep their coats and pants from freezing on them. It was all they could do to keep from freezing. They could not keep warm. Some of the men, when we were out to drive away the rebels from the other side of the mountain, were hungry, and they stopped behind us at a farmhouse to get something to eat, and the wicked rebels caught them, and took their overcoats away from them, and took their warm boots off their feet, and some of the poor fellows got away from them and walked all the way from the rebel camp over the frozen ground barefooted. Today the soldiers have done nothing but build big fires and stand close up to them and try to keep warm. These poor soldiers and your papa have come away from our homes and left good mamas and dear little daughters 
to keep the wicked bad rebels from making this country a poor unhappy one and that when little alice and the dear children of the other soldiers grow up they will have a good and a happy country and won't have to know about wars and such terrible things you must remember about the poor soldiers and pray god that he will be very kind to them and make the time come soon when they and your papa can all of them go home to their dear little daughters and good mamas. Kiss mamma and little sister Edith for me, and tell your little cousins Gwen and Foster and Johnny that your papa hopes to come home soon, and that he will then come around with you and see them all. As intimated in the last letter to my wife, General Foster did make a forward movement with his entire force, and push the enemy toward the Virginia line but thereafter there was a lull in army operations for the rest of the winter on both sides. The time had come for which I had so long looked, when I could without injury to the service ask for a leave of absence, which General Foster, commanding the department, cheerfully granted, and before the last of January 1864 I was on my way home, going by way of Chattanooga and Nashville, as the railroad communication was then well established. I have noted the death of my father in April 1863, he had been actively engaged in extensive mercantile affairs, and while not wealthy, as the world estimates wealth now, was possessed of considerable property, both real and personal. By his will he made me the executor of his estate and guardian of the two minor children. In August 1863, after I was well on the march to East Tennessee, I received a letter from my brother, stating that the court at Evansville had required my presence in the proceedings for the settlement of my father's estate but I obtained a stay until I should be able to get released from my army duties, with the assurance on my part that I would make as little delay as possible. When I reached home I found the affairs of my father's estate in such condition that I could not conclude my duties as executor in the time fixed for my leave from my command. There was the widow, two minor and four adult heirs claiming attention to my duties as executor. Under the circumstances I felt proper to tender my resignation from the army, especially as I had already determined to do so at the expiration of my three years' term of service, which would be within four months. There was no reason for me to tender my resignation except the undischarged duty of executor and my earnest desire to be with my family. During my entire service I had enjoyed good health and was pleased with the active life. I had been reasonably successful in military affairs and had held large and important commands to the satisfaction of my superior officers, and there was every prospect of my early promotion in rank. But I put aside preferment and possible military distinction for the more immediate call of family duty. The outlook for the suppression of the rebellion was at that date most favorable. Grant had been made commander-in-chief, and was organizing his army for the final march on Richmond. Sherman was preparing for his advance on Atlanta, and his march to the sea, and at no time since the opening of hostilities had the cause of the Union looked so auspicious. General Sturgis, in command of the Cavalry Corps to which I belonged, in forwarding my resignation to the Department General, made the following endorsement. In approving this resignation, I cannot refrain from expressing my deep regret in parting with so intelligent, energetic, and brave an officer. I have for some time been aware of the business and family interests which I feared would sooner or later deprive the army of the services of Colonel Foster, yet after so long and faithful service he should be, I think, relieved under the circumstances. His loss, however, will be severely felt in this corps, and his place hard to fill." When my resignation became known to the 65th Regiment, the officers held a meeting in which a series of resolutions were adopted, declaring that Colonel Foster, since his connection with the regiment, has been unceasing in his labors in, and untiring in his devotion to, the cause in which we are engaged, and has spared no means to render his regiment efficient, that he has commanded the regiment with distinguished honor to himself and to the regiment, that in his resignation the regiment and the service have lost an efficient and valuable officer, and that he bears with him to his home our highest esteem and our best wishes as a citizen. An editorial of considerable length appeared in the Evansville Journal, from which the following is an extract. We regret exceedingly to learn that Colonel John W. Foster has felt it to be his duty to resign his commission as Colonel of the 65th Indiana Regiment, and that his resignation has been accepted. We have known for some time that circumstances, growing out of his father's death, occasioned an almost absolute necessity for his personal attention to the settlement of a vast amount of unfinished business left by the judge. We're conspiring to force Colonel Foster out of the service, but we were in hope that matters might be so arranged as to enable him to remain in the field. It seems, however, that this could not be done, and our government loses the services of one of its most gallant, energetic, and experienced officers. Colonel Foster entered the service of his country in the summer of 1861, 
as major of the 25th Regiment Indiana Volunteers. He laid aside the profession of the law and took upon himself the profession of arms, from a conscientious belief that his first service was due to his government. Without experience or even a theoretical knowledge of military life when he entered the service, so close was his application to study that but a short time elapsed before he was a thorough master of all the duties incumbent upon his position as major of the regiment, or for that matter with any position connected with the regiment. Colonel Foster was a rigid disciplinarian, yet he exacted nothing from his men that was not essential to the efficiency of his regiment, or that he was unwilling to perform himself. After a detailed review of my military service, it adds, Colonel Foster has proven his patriotism by his actions, and in retiring to private life he will carry with him the assurance that he has merited the good wishes of his countrymen and secured the great satisfaction of an approving conscience. From an editorial in the Louisville Journal, the following is extracted. The resignation of Colonel John W. Foster of the 65th Indiana Regiment has been accepted. His retirement from the Army is to be regretted, as he was one of the most experienced, efficient, and gallant officers in the service. After a sketch of my military career, it says, Colonel Foster accompanied the great expedition of General Burnside in the movement on East Tennessee, at times commanding brigades and even divisions. Just before tendering his resignation, he was recommended for a Brigadier General's Commission by Generals Burnside and Grant. Important business related to his father's estate demanded immediate attention and forced his resignation. The Army and the country alike regret his retirement to private life. End of Chapter 7《Chapter Eight of War Stories for My Grandchildren. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by H. K. Virgil. War Stories for My Grandchildren by John Watson Foster. Chapter Eight with the Hundred Days Men. About three months elapsed after my return home from the East Tennessee campaign when a new appeal was made to me to re enter the military service. General Sherman was assembling at and near Chattanooga an army to make his great drive on Atlanta and into the very heart of the rebellion. To succeed in his decisive movement, he had to draw his supplies from the north of the Ohio River over a single long line of railroad communication, reaching from Louisville through the states of Kentucky and Tennessee to Chattanooga and beyond as his army advanced. This line of supplies was mainly through hostile territory, and every part of it had to be guarded by armed soldiers. In order to give Sherman every possible trained soldier to swell his army so as to make the movement a success, it was determined to send all the soldiers then guarding this line of railroad to the front, which would prove a large addition to the fighting force of Sherman's army, and to replace them as guards with new recruits, who could be effective behind entrenchments and when on the defensive. Accordingly, the governors of the states of the Middle West made a call upon their several states for regiments of volunteers to serve for 100 days, the estimated period of Sherman's campaign to Atlanta. The call upon the state of Indiana was responded to with alacrity, and within a few days several regiments were formed and in a short time made ready for service. It was the desire of Governor Morton to have these raw recruits commanded, as far as possible, as colonels and other staff officers, by men who had already seen service and were experienced in actual fighting. One of these regiments, largely made up from Evansville and the adjoining counties, expressed a strong desire that I might be appointed to command them and this action was followed by a telegram from Governor Morton tendering me a commission as colonel, and making a strong appeal to me to again give my services to the country in this great emergency. I confess the call did not strongly appeal to me from a military standpoint, as the contemplated service did not promise any distinction in warlike operations. But, on the other hand, it was a service which would be just as useful in promoting Sherman's success as if we should be sent to the front and take part in the actual fighting. For without this line of communication for supplies being maintained, his campaign must assuredly prove a failure. I recall the fact in ancient history that the greatest of Hebrew generals, following the well-recognized rules of warfare, insisted on giving to those who guarded the camp and protected the line to the rear the same honor and emoluments as those who did the fighting. The scriptural historian has preserved King David's words, quote, As his part is that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff they shall part alike." Unquote. So important did he deem this principle that the historian records that, quote, from that day forward he made it a statute and an ordinance for Israel unto this day, unquote. 
I had made much progress in the business of settling my father's estate, the cause of my previous resignation, and having secured my wife's consent to my reenlistment, there seemed to be no good reason for not responding to the call of the governor and my townsmen and neighbors. And within three days after tender of my commission, I was on the way to put myself at the head of the 136 Indiana Infantry Volunteers. I have indicated that the character of the service to which we were to be assigned, the guarding of the railroad, did not promise any brilliant military exploits, and the extracts which I shall make from my letters may not be found of much interest, but they will at least set forth the manner in which we filled up our hundred days' service in the cause of our country. The 136th Indiana was mustered into service May 23, 1864, at Indianapolis, and passed through Louisville. My letter of the 31st states, quote, we left Louisville on Saturday morning, and I stationed the companies along the railroad from Shepherdsville to Nolan, ten miles below here, Elizabethtown, on the railroad. I had hardly got the companies distributed, selected my headquarters here, and got my dinner before the train arrived from Nashville, bringing an aide to Major General Rousseau, who was on the hunt for the 136th Indiana, which should go to his command in Tennessee. But he saw by the Louisville papers that it had been stopped and would go along to the railroad. The aide had orders for me to go direct to Nashville at once, disregarding all orders from all sources but the War Department. But as General Burbage had ordered me to come here, and as I was in his district, and was guarding important bridges which should not be abandoned, I decided to wait until the generals should get their conflict and orders adjusted. We have been waiting in doubt as to our future for two days. Meanwhile, the generals had been telegraphing with each other and with me, until last night I received orders to go to Nashville as soon as transportation was provided. How soon the cars will be ready to take me to town, I do not know. Unquote. Within two days we arrived in Nashville, once my letter of June 4th says, quote, I wrote you a note yesterday that we would go to Murfreesboro. I went down there yesterday and returned this morning. I will be off for that place again in an hour with three companies. The rest of the regiment will follow tonight and in the morning. We shall not be quite so well situated there as we were at Elizabethtown, nor for that matter as comfortably situated as at home, but I think we can get through the 100 days there at least tolerably safely, which is the great point with you, is it not? Uncle Tom arrived here yesterday from the 65th in poor health. I have been hunting for him this morning, but have not as yet been able to find him." Unquote. This last refers to Colonel Johnson, of whom I have made reference in previous letters. Three times he had been granted furlough on account of ill health, but with the grim determination of a martyr, he persisted in his effort to remain with his command, at that time at the front with Sherman's army. In my letter of June 8th, I give an account of our camp and surroundings at Murfreesboro. Quote, when we arrived here, the general directed me to camp the regiment in the fortress, a large and very strong series of earthworks and rifle pits, built by Rosecrans' army after the Battle of Stone River. The enclosures are large, open spaces, without a particle of shade or grass, entirely exposed to the sun. The troops already in the fortress have erected tolerably comfortable barracks, but there was no material out of which to make any more, and as our men had nothing but shelter tents, I was afraid if put into such a camp the exposure would bring on sickness. So I rode all around the vicinity of the town and found several very good camping places, and induced the general to let us camp out of the fortress in such suitable place as I might select. I found a very fine camp in a beautiful grove just at the edge of town, and adjoining a very fine spring of water, which pleases officers and men very much. Two companies are stationed below on the railroad, and we shall have eight companies here, making a very respectable battalion. How long we will remain here is very uncertain, but we shall be very well satisfied to stay here during the remainder of our 100 days. Since we went into camp, I have been busy putting the regiment through in drills and duties of soldiers, keeping officers and men quite busy. Besides these drills, Lieutenant Colonel Walker drills the officers an hour, and I have two recitations of officers an hour each in tactics and regulations. In the evenings after supper, I give them a lecture on the Army regulations, organization, and military customs, which is quite as profitable to me as to them, as it requires considerable study and posting on my part. We had our first battalion drill today, and it proved quite interesting. At the present rate of daily duties, in one month I shall have the regiment in a condition to compare favorably with the veteran regiments in drill at least. I want to bring them home well drilled and thoroughly instructed in the duties of the soldier. 
I have the reputation of being a strict disciplinarian, but I think the officers and the intelligent men appreciate it. The exercises not only make them better soldiers, but the act of service makes them more healthy than to lie idle in camp. Our camping ground is on the lawn in front of one of the finest houses in the state. The surroundings were before the ravages of war very beautiful. The house was the headquarters of the rebel General Bragg before he fell back after the Battle of Stone River. The owner was formerly quite wealthy, the possessor of a large plantation here and one in Mississippi. He is now keeping a store in town for the support of his family, reaping the reward of the rebellion of himself and relatives. Unquote. In my letter of June 13, I give another view of camp life. Quote, Yesterday was our first real Sabbath in camp, and we spent it very pleasantly. We had the Sunday morning inspection at 8 o'clock, beginning it with a short religious exercise by the chaplain. The inspection would have been very creditable to old soldiers. The men had their arms and accoutrements and clothing in fine order and looked well. These Sunday morning inspections have a fine effect. It causes the men to clean up themselves and their arms, and makes them feel it is a real Sabbath, which they are likely to forget in camp. After inspection, we were quite liberal in allowing the men more passes for the day, going out in squads in charge of officers. Some went to church, but many went to stroll over the battlefield of Stone River, which is about two miles from town. Major Hines and I went into town to church and heard Dr. Gazadin preach. He has just returned from the South. The doctor is, or was, a new school Presbyterian of some reputation in Tennessee before the rebellion. He is a bitter rebel, but, of course, did not give any manifestation of it in his services. There was a strong new school church here before the war, but they were all rebels, the church building almost ruined by the armies and its members very much scattered. At five we had preaching by our chaplain, a Baptist brother from Spencer County, a good man but a very poor preacher, an old farmer and ignorant is worse than the chaplains of my other two regiments. I shall go out of the war, I fear, with a poor opinion of chaplains from personal experience. Although our chaplain's sermon was a poor affair, the men were attentive and respectful. Altogether, the day was very creditably passed by the 136 Indiana. But how much more pleasantly and profitably it would have been spent by me at home, with my family, and at our own church." Unquote. In a letter of June 15, I refer to the character of the regiment. Quote, we are getting along very pleasantly in camp. Everything passes off quietly. The men are making a commendable degree of progress in the drill and take to soldiering very readily. Thus far, I have had no difficulty in controlling the men. I never saw a regiment more easily governed. This comes in part from its personnel. Being called upon for only 100 days of service, many business and professional men, who could not well afford to give up their businesses entirely, can arrange to go into the army for so short a time, and as a result, the lower officers and the men are many of them among our best citizens. Besides, the service is easy. We have none of the hard marches and exposures described by me in the campaigning of the 25th and the 65th Indiana. As a private in one of the Evansville companies was my younger brother, James H., who left the senior class at Indiana University before graduating to serve his country. Unquote. This letter also relates an event which brings out the terrible consequences of war in dividing families, especially in the border state of Kentucky. Quote, I wrote you some time since that a brother of Major Himes, of our 136, was in the rebel army and had been at home at Bardstown, Kentucky. Hines received a letter this evening from his father, telling him that his brother had been killed in trying to get back through our lines to the southern army. He was shot in the woods and lay in the bushes two weeks before his father found the body. Unquote. Referring to the rebel cavalry raids, which were just then threatening Washington and Baltimore, I wrote, quote, Even if Washington is burnt, the rebels can't hold it, and it would be the means, I hope, of rising up the north to renewed efforts, and then there would be a good opportunity to remove the capital to the west, where it ought to be. We have not suffered enough in the North yet to make the people see that there is to be no peace with the rebels except by their complete overthrow. Otherwise we are disgraced, ruined, forever destroyed as a nation. We must and will, in the end, put down this wicked rebellion. The ways of providence are inscrutable. God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. But he is a God of justice and right, and we will triumph in the end. Had I been an infidel or a weak believer in the righteousness of God, Long since I would have been discouraged, but I am not. 
Let us pray for our country, for the triumph of right, of truth, of freedom, and that God may, in his wisdom, hasten the end of this bloody war and the return of peace, and that we may together live to enjoy our family and Christian privileges under it. Unquote. On July 16, I report, quote, General Van Cleve has been temporarily called to Tullahoma, which leaves me in command of the post and brigade here, including Fortress Rosecrans. The change will probably be for only a few days or a week. I would much rather be with the regiment, as I am interested in the drill and instruction of the regiment and can spend the time pleasantly with them. I am now at headquarters of the post very comfortably situated, have a room for myself carpeted and well furnished. Captain Otis, General Van Cleve's adjutant general, a very competent officer, is left here, and he has his wife with him. It looks quite homelike to sit down at a table with a lady to preside and also to nurse the baby. It was reported that the rebels were crossing the Tennessee River yesterday at Claysville, intending to make a raid on the railroad, but I hardly believe it. Unquote. A bright side of the soldier's life is given in my letter of July 21. Quote, we have no news of special importance. I don't have very much to do in my post command. I'm comfortably situated in quarters, and have about enough business to keep the time from being dull. Captain Otis and his wife and I are the only members of our mess, and we have a very pleasant table. When General Rosecrans was in command here, he established a large hospital garden, worked by the convalescents in the hospitals. It is now producing large quantities of vegetables, and our table is very liberally supplied from it with green corn, tomatoes, beets, cucumbers, potatoes, squashes, etc., we also enjoy plenty of milk and butter, with ice to cool them. The general left his servant here, and he has nothing to do but take care of my room, black my boots, and brush my clothes, etc. There are a number of officers' wives here, and we have frequent company in our parlor of these and occasionally of rebel ladies. So you see, the hardships of the poor soldier's life at present being undergone by me are such as I may be able to endure with safety to my life. Unquote. In my letter of July 30, I report my return to the regiment. Quote, General Van Cleve arrived last night, and I returned to the command of the regiment. I think it was needing my attention from appearances. In the two weeks I have been absent, there has been only one battalion drill. Although this is Saturday afternoon, and we are not accustomed to having drill that afternoon, yet I am going to give them battalion drill to make up for lost time. I want them to make a fine appearance when we return to Indiana. We are now drilling in the bayonet exercise, which interests the men very much." Unquote. A week later I write, quote, We are having, as usual, a quiet Sabbath. My present term of service is so very different from that which I have heretofore been used to. Before it was all activity, bustle, battles, pursuits, or retreats. But now it is all the quiet monotony of camp life, broken only by the routine of drill. Heretofore I seldom had a quiet Sunday. Now I can read my Bible and religious papers regularly, write to my dear one, and attend church services. But with all these privileges, there is no day in which I miss home so much. Unquote. Taking advantage of our quiet camp life, I obtained leave to visit Knoxville, where I had spent so many pleasant days the year before. My letter of the 13th of August gives some account of that visit. Quote, Does it look natural to you to see this letter dated from Knoxville? I left Murfreesboro day before yesterday, woke up in the morning, and found myself across the Tennessee River and in the midst of the mountains. The scenery is quite romantic and attractive. I felt at once that I was in East Tennessee. There is nothing in scenery like the mountains. In a little while we came in sight of Lookout Mountain, stretching far away with its range into Georgia, and jutting up with its bold promontory into the Tennessee River. And far above the mist of the river, rose the spur so celebrated as Hooker's Battle of the Clouds. Soon we came into Chattanooga, bristling with its many battlements, and alive with the hurry and bustle of that great army depot. It is astonishing to note what a vast machinery requires in the rear to support and keep supplied a large army. The run up to Knoxville was quite pleasant, where we arrived at half-past five in the evening. On my way up to the hotel, I met an old Tennessee acquaintance who acted as a guide for me in my raids last autumn. He would listen to nothing but that I must be his guest, so I went around and stopped with him. I came down in town in the evening and called on some of my old friends who showed much pleasure in seeing me again. 
Today I have been busy in calling on other old friends, and took dinner today with Mrs. Locke, who was very glad to have me again at her house. I am to take supper with General Tillotson, commanding the post. I have found a number of the old 65th and of my staff here on detailed duty. They are organizing an expedition for a raid into Upper East Tennessee, in my old route of campaigning, and to be frank, I have been very much tempted to go up with them, as they are anxious to have me. But it would detain me beyond my leave, and I might expect a scolding from my dear little wife, so I will leave in two or three days and return direct to Murfreesboro. Unquote. As the term of enlistment of our regiment was drawing to a close, a movement was set on foot to have me continue in the service. The Union men of western Kentucky were very anxious to have me return to that district and drive out the guerrillas, who had been very troublesome after I left that region. They had been in conference with my older brother George, who took a great pride in my military career and was very ambitious for me. The plan was to have me made a brigadier general and given a special command of western Kentucky. When this was made known to me, I answered my brother George that if the command was tendered me without any effort on my part, I might take it into consideration, but only on the express condition that my wife would consent to it. It is to this plan I refer in some of my letters to her. In the one of July 31, I say, quote, The expiration of our term of enlistment is drawing near, and a strong effort will be made to get our regiment to re-enlist for one, two, or three years. What do you say? Must I go in for it? They are also writing me from Kentucky, urging me to come back there and clear the guerrillas out of my old field of operations. I must confess the latter proposition is something of a temptation to me. I would like to spend three or four weeks there in chasing out the guerrillas, and then I really do believe I would come home and stay there in peace. Unquote. On August 7, I write my wife, quote, I had been back from the army just long enough with my wife and little darlings to appreciate how much I had missed during the three years gone. And I do believe when I get home this time, I shall be able to conclude that I have discharged my duty to my country and done my share of the fighting, and that I have also a duty to discharge to my family, which I have sadly neglected for the three years past. And I hope that for the rest of my life I shall devote myself to them. Major Hines was saying to me the other day that you had acted so nobly during my absence he thought I owed it to you and my children when I was out of the service this time to stay at home. But I take so much interest in the war and am so thoroughly satisfied with the correctness of the principles for which it is being prosecuted that I must confess I do not like to leave the army when all of our experienced officers and men are so badly needed. But I hope I will be able to see my duty clear to stay at home. I trust my influence and efforts there will not be entirely useless. Unquote. I wrote fully to my wife of the plans of my Kentucky friends and my brother, and from my letters it appears they met with her decided disapproval. On August 20, I wrote, quote, I was sorry on my return from Knoxville and read your letters and saw how you felt about my going into the service again, that I had written George on the subject. Unquote. And again I wrote, quote, I was sorry to know from your letter that my letter in which I had said something about re-entering the service had given you any pain or solicitude, as I did not design that it should do so. I never yet have entered the service or left home except with your consent or approval, and I will not do it in the future. As I have written before, I think I have served my country long enough to serve my family a while, and I hope nothing will occur to prevent my early return to my home." Unquote. Some fear was entertained that the efforts of the Confederate cavalry to break up the railroad connections would detain our regiment in Tennessee beyond the term of enlistment, but no such untoward event occurred. The 136 left Murfreesboro on August 25 under my command, passed through Louisville the next day, and the day following took the cars at New Albany for Indianapolis. The citizens of Bloomington, the seat of Indiana University, where the Foster Boys had received their education, having noticed that the regiment would pass their town about noon, entertained them with a hurried but sumptuous dinner. We found a warm supper awaiting us and were comfortably quartered at Indianapolis in barracks, where we spent one week waiting to be paid off and mustered out of the service. During this time, we took part in a review by Governor Morton of 6,000 troops gathered at the capital of the state, and in this, our regimental parades, we were enabled with much pride to exhibit our accomplishments in soldiery. In the introduction to the compilation of these letters, I described myself in entering the service as a peaceman, 
as having no desire for military glory, having no special fitness for the life of a soldier, and entertaining a horror of war. The reader of these letters must have noted the gradual development of a taste for, or satisfaction with, the service. Even at the outset in Missouri, in describing in glowing colors the exposure to the climate and the hard marching, I manifest a certain enthusiasm for my success as a wagon master, or for my perspective work of an architect of the log hut winter quarters. I early mastered the tactics, army regulations, and camp regime, and often wrote of my interest in the drill and regimental and brigade exercises. I referred to the gallant charges of our regiment and brigade at Donelson, and speak of some parts of the bloody battle of Shiloh as grand beyond description. I hardly had words sufficient to describe the deliverance by our army of the Union citizens of East Tennessee. My intercourse with my comrades, superior and inferior officers and men, is noticed as in all respects agreeable. When I entered the army, I was not robust, having too long led a student and office life, but during my entire service I enjoyed almost uninterrupted good health, the letters constantly speaking of how the outdoor life and the most active campaigning best agreed with me. So that it has been seen that while at the end of three years of army service I was rejoiced to go back to my home, to my wife and little ones, an offer to re-enter the army was quite a temptation to me. But my life in the army did not alter the views I had formed in my college life of the horror and futility of war, but rather strengthened and confirmed them. I witnessed the sad effects of the conflict in dividing and embittering brothers of the same blood, the ravages of the battlefield and the hospital, the valuable lives lost and the widows and orphans, the enormous expenditure of money, and the great war debt and pensions to be paid by a coming generation. All these evils might have been avoided by a peaceful adjustment of the questions which were settled by the armed conflict. The emancipation of the slaves by purchase would have been many times less than the cost of the war and money, without counting the savings of the lives lost, the widows and orphans, and the bitterness engendered. There is a certain glamour about warfare which attracts the participant, but it is fictitious and unchristian. I pray God that our country may be delivered from its horrors in the future. The End End of Chapter 8 With the Hundred Days Men Recording by H.K. Virgil Appendix of Four Stories for My Grandchildren this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ron Broach. War Stories for My Grandchildren by John Watson Foster. Appendix Indiana Soldiers Monument. Some years after the close of the Civil War, the legislature of Indiana determined to erect a monument at Indianapolis, designed to glorify the heroic epoch of the Republic, and to commemorate the valor and fortitude of Indiana's soldiers and sailors in the War of the Rebellion and other wars. The cornerstone of this monument was laid in 1887 with appropriate services, including an oration by President Benjamin Harrison. It was completed and dedicated in 1902. It stands upon a terrace 110 feet in diameter, with a foundation of 69 by 53 feet. The height of the monument from street level is 284 feet, and is crowned by a victory statue of 38 feet. On subordinate pedestals occupying positions in the four segments are bronze statues of Governor Morton, Governor Whitcomb, General William Henry Harrison, and General George Rogers Clark. It is claimed to be the largest and most expensive soldier's monument in the United States, and one of the grandest achievements of architectural and sculptural art in the world. The dedication services on the completion of the monument were held on May 15, 1902, attended by military and civic delegations from all parts of the state. Parades, salutes, dedication exercises, and illuminations occupying the entire day and evening. The dedication address follows. Address of John W. Foster, delivered at the dedication of Soldiers' Monument at Indianapolis, May 15, 1902. Mr. Chairman, 
Governor Durbin, comrades and fellow citizens, we are gathered today inspired by the mingled feelings of joy and sadness, of pride and sorrow, to the generation who have come upon the stage of public life since the scenes were enacted which are glorified in this noble monument. It may well be an occasion of exultation, for they see only the blessings conferred upon the state and nation by the deeds of heroic dead whose memories we are assembled to honor. But to those of us who were their comrades in service, there arises the sad recollection of the carnage of battle and the wasting experience of the hospital. While the stirring notes of martial music, the booming of cannon, and the waving of flags awaken the enthusiasm and the patriotic pride of the people, there are many mothers and widows to whom this brilliant scene is but the reopening of the fountain not yet dried up by two score years of weeping. It is for no idle purpose I recall the solemn phase of the pageantry of these dedication services, for it cannot fail to impress more deeply upon us the debt we owe to the men for whom this magnificent memorial has been raised. It commemorates the sacrifice of twenty-five thousand men, Indiana's contribution to the cause of the Union, a fearful price this nation paid for its life. A veritable army is this, larger than any gathered under Washington or Scott. In those dark days when our comrades were pouring out their life's blood on a hundred battlefields, when new calls were made for more men to fill the depleted ranks, when the scales hung trembling between success and failure, it seemed sometimes as if the state could not endure the fearful slaughter. But the triumph of the right came at last, and time has healed the scars of war. We can now look back upon the scene as one only of heroic deeds. It was highly appropriate that on the apex of this shaft there should be placed the emblem of victory. Never in the history of human warfare has there been a triumph more significant of blessing to mankind. The goddess of victory crowns this monument, but it is not in exultation over a fallen foe. I thank God that in the dedication services today there is no feeling of bitterness toward the men who fought against our dead comrades. We rejoice to know that they are loyal citizens with us of a common country. We must not, however, belittle the sacrifice of our honored dead. Right, humanity, and progress were on the side of the Union armies, and it was chiefly for this reason we have reared this noble pile of bronze and marble. What the victory they gained signifies to this nation, to this continent, and to all peoples, has been so often, so exhaustively, so eloquently told, that I hesitate to even allude to it. But my observation in foreign lands has so forcibly impressed on me one of the inestimable blessings which has been secured to us and to future generations by the triumph of the Union arms, that I deem this a fitting occasion to call it to mind. Scarcely second in importance to the maintenance of Republican government in its purity and vigor and the extirpation of slavery are the reign of peace and deliverance from standing armies which the unbroken Union guarantees to us and our children. It requires no vivid imagination to conceive of some of the results which would have followed a division of the states, a frontier lined with fortifications, bristling with cannon and garrisoned by a hostile soldiery, conscription and taxation such as never been known before, constant alarms of war, and political and international complications which would have put an end to our boasted American policy and Monroe Doctrine. One of the things which most attracts the attention of foreigners who visit our shores is the absence of soldiers about our public buildings, in our cities, and along the thoroughfares of commerce. And those who have never seen our country can scarcely realize that it is possible to carry on a government of order and stability without a constant show of military force. In all the nations of Europe, it has been for so many generations the continuous practice to maintain standing armies that it is considered a necessary and normal part of the system of political organizations. The existence of rival and neighboring nations constantly on the alert to protect themselves from encroachment on their territory and to maintain their own integrity, 
and the recent advances in military science and warlike equipment have caused a great increase in the armies, enormously enlarged the expenditures, and compelled a rigorous enforcement of the most exacting and burdensome terms of service until today. In this high noon of Christian civilization, Europe is one vast military camp, and, with such tension in the international relations that the slightest incident may set its armies in battle array, the merest spark lights the fires of war and envelop the continent, if not the whole world, in the conflagration. Germany and France maintain an army on a peace footing of about a half million men each, Russia of three-quarters of a million, and other continental powers' armies of relatively large proportions. The term of military service required in each is from three to four years. To support these enormous burdens, the nations of Europe have imposed upon their inhabitants the most oppressive taxation, and, besides, have multiplied their public debts to the utmost extent of their national credit. But great as these exactions are, they are as nothing compared to the heavy demands made for the personal military service of the people. To take from the best energies of every young man's life from three to four years, just at the time when he is ready to lay the foundations of his career and establish his domestic relations, is a tax which can scarcely be estimated in money value, and is a burden upon the inhabitants so heavy and so irritating that they stagger under its weight and would rebel against it, did they dare resist the iron tyranny of military rule. Thanks to the soldiers who fought triumphantly for the maintenance of our Union of States, and that there might continue to be one great and supreme nation on this continent, we are released from this curse of a large standing army, we are free from its burdensome taxation and debt. Our young men are permitted to devote the flower of their lives to useful industry and domestic enjoyment, and our free institutions are not menaced by military oppression. To conquer a peace such as the world has not heretofore seen, and to secure a reign of prosperity and plenty which no other people of the present or past has enjoyed, did the men of Indiana fight and die. We are here to honor the soldier and the sailor, but it is well to recall that ours is not a warlike people, and I pray God they never may be. An event which greatly attracted the attention of Europe was that when our civil war was over, the vast armies of nearly two millions of men quietly laid down their arms and, without outlawry or marauding, retired to their homes to renew their peaceful avocations. They had not become professional soldiers. They were citizens of a great republic and felt their responsibilities as such. In all, our foreign wars have occupied less than five years in a period of 120 of our independence. Our greatest achievements as a nation have been in the domain of peace. The one aggressive war in which we have been engaged was that with Mexico, and it was the unrighteous cause of slavery which led us to depart from the line of justice in that instance. It is to be hoped that no evil influence or ambition will ever again lead us into the acts of unjustifiable aggression. In the Spanish War, I think I speak the sentiment of the great majority of my countrymen when I say, it was a feeling of humanity which occasioned that conflict. It was brought with the results which we could not anticipate and which many of our people lament. It has led to the expulsion of Spain and its bad system of government from this hemisphere, certainly not an untoward event. If it was a desire to benefit our fellow men that led us into that contest, I feel sure that the same spirit will control our conduct toward the millions of people on the other side of the globe whom the fortunes of war have so unexpectedly brought into our domain. We are proud of the record which our country has made in the settlement of disputes with foreign nations by the peaceful method of arbitration. It is possible that all matters of difference cannot be adjusted in that way, but it offers a remedy which commends itself to the lover of peace and goodwill among men, and it is our boast that we have resorted to it more often than any other nation. It is not incumbent on me to give any account of this structure so perfect in art, so appropriate in design. 
embracing all arms of the military service on land and sea. I must, however, as a comrade of those whose fame it perpetuates, bear cheerful testimony to the generosity of a grateful people, who have reared this costly column. It is in keeping also with the munificence of the federal government in all that relates to the memory and welfare of those who fought to secure the union of these states. In the national capital and throughout the land, in every city and in almost every town, there are monuments to the Union soldiers, and the important battlefields have been turned into public parks consecrated to the nation's dead. And no government has been so liberal in its provisions for the surviving veterans. Listen to a few eloquent figures. At the close of the war for the Union, our national debt amounted to the stupendous sum of two billion seven hundred million dollars and yet there has been paid out of the national treasury since that date for pensions an amount equal to that sum. Before the Spanish War, the pension roll amounted to two-fifths of the entire expenses of the government, and it is, even now, with this large increase of both civil and military list, one-fourth of the total. The payments on this account for the last year were about $140 million dollars, there are now on the roll, nearly forty years after the war, 997,735 pensioners. Of the amount paid out, the pensioners from Indiana receive $10,291,000 every year, and the Indianians on the list number 66,974. The two great martial nations of Europe are France and Germany but their expenditures for military pensions are only one-fifth and one-sixth of ours. In addition to these unparalleled disbursements, vast sums have been expended for the establishment and maintenance of soldiers' home in various parts of the country. Surely the old soldier cannot charge his government with ingratitude. This day constitutes the culmination of the history of Indiana. This imposing monument peerless of its kind among the nations, the gift of a rich and prosperous commonwealth, the testimonial of a grateful people to the men who gave their lives to save the Union and perpetuate free institution, stands today, with the quaterion of soldiers and statesmen about it, a memorial of past achievement, an evidence of present accomplishment in government, society, and industry, an assurance of future prosperity and happiness. It was a wise discernment of the memorable epochs in the history of the state which caused to be associated with this central monument the statues of the two soldiers and of the two statesmen who adorned this artistic circle. Of all the soldiers who were famous in the war of the Revolution, few have rendered more imperishable services to the country than General George Rogers Clark. I have not the time to dwell on his military career. You recall the repeated journeys he made across the mountains from his Kentucky home to implore the revolutionary authorities to furnish him the means to save the great Northwest to the new nation. The story of his voyage down the Ohio with a mere handful of resolute patriots, his capture of Kaskaskia, his marvelous march in the dead of winter to the assault and capture of Vincennes, are among the most thrilling narratives of that heroic struggle. Yet history has failed to give him due credit for his great achievement. But for his expedition, it is safe to say that the Northwest would have remained British territory, and Indiana would today be a crown colony or a Canadian province, rather than a free commonwealth of independent people. Had the United States been confined in its territorial extent to the Atlantic seaboard, as our ally France wished it to be, the young republic might have survived as a shriveled and sickly nation under the guardianship of France. But the vast expansion to the northwest, across the Mississippi, to the Pacific coast, and to the islands of the Orient never could have taken place. As we look upon that dashing figure, molded in bronze, let us not forget the great debt we, and all this nation, owe to the intrepid soldier who conquered the Northwest. The second period of history of Indiana is fitly represented by General William Henry Harrison, the territorial governor and the defender of the frontier. 
He stands for the men who laid the foundations of our government and society and freed the territory from the ruthless savage. In Governor Whitcomb we have a typical Indianian of the early period of statehood. A farmer's son, he had his share, as a boy and young man, of the privations of frontier life, the Herculean labor of clearing away the forest and bringing the land under cultivation. At the same period of time, Indiana was nurturing another young man in like experience and labors of frontier life, that matchless American, Abraham Lincoln. In this area of abounding prosperity and luxurious living, we are too apt to forget that they rest upon the toils and trials of our fathers. Whitcomb showed the stuff of which he was made by supporting himself at school and college by his own manual labor. He filled many public offices with usefulness and honor, and had the distinction of occupying the gubernatorial chair during the Mexican War, in which Indiana soldiers did their full share toward the victories which gained for us the wide domain stretching to the Pacific. For the fourth period of the history of Indiana, which records the contest for the preservation of the Union, there could be but one man whose statue could be a companion piece to this superb monument. No soldier, no citizen, no man high or low could take a rank in point of heroic service, of tireless labors, of commanding influence, of exposure to dangers, of courage, self-denial, and suffering, with Oliver P. Morton. He was a man endowed with rare intellectuality, and made a high place for himself in the nation as a statesman. But to the people of Indiana, and especially to the old soldiers, he will be remembered as the great war governor. It is fitting that the name of another son of Indiana should be mentioned on this occasion. His statue is not in this circle, but will soon adorn another portion of this beautiful capital. When the cornerstone of this edifice was laid thirteen years ago, he took part in the exercises, and, but for his untimely death, would doubtless have been called to occupy my place in this day's dedication. Benjamin Harrison has the distinction of being the first to inspire this great undertaking, now so happily consummated. He himself was a gallant soldier and would have rejoiced to participate in this pageant. In every department of public and private life he did his work well, and we are proud to honor him as president and citizen. It is a pleasing service to thus recall the names of some of our public men. I heartily believe in state pride. I believe in local attachments. The association which cluster about the home are the dearest and the best. If we as Indianians have not in times past been as conspicuous as some of our neighbors for our state pride, it was not because we loved Indiana less, but the Union more. And since we have forever settled the question of state rights, I see no reason why we should not, on all proper occasions, and with the vehemence of domestic loyalty, exalt our state, and boast of its resources, its merits, and its memories. Among these there are none which constitute a nobler heritage or awaken more enthusiastic pride than the services and attainments of our public men. I have not dwelt at any length upon the wonderful prosperity which our country is now enjoying as one of the direct results of the preservation of the Union. We all rejoice in our present high and honorable position among the nations of the earth, and we may well look forward to a continuance of this era of peace and prosperity. But in the day of our exultation we should remember that no people of the earth have proved to be indestructible as a nation. Every country may carry within itself the seeds of its own dissolution. We need not revert to the history of Rome, Greece, Egypt, or Assyria to learn of the decay and death of empires. The archaeologist tells us that in the territory covered by the state of Indiana there once existed, at a period so remote that no legend of them remained among the aborigines at the discovery by Columbus, a great and powerful people who built populous cities, were possessed of a high grade of military science, were advanced in the arts, founded dynasties, had an educated priesthood, and were of a heroic frame. 
I have not time to moralize upon this, but I venture a few practical suggestions which may appeal to us as citizens of a great nation whose prosperity and happiness we desire may continue through all time. If we would realize this expectation, we must have an honest government, federal, state, and local. I have given the figures which show the enormous expenditures for pensions. It is common rumor that this sum has been swelled by perjury and fraud. Every faithful soldier who receives a pension from the government justly regards it as a badge of honor. He should watch with jealous care that no deserter, no skulker, no unworthy camp follower, through the cunning of dishonest claim agents, should have the same badge of honor. So also bribery and corruption in our public and municipal bodies may soon destroy the foundations of our national life. All good citizens should denounce and combine to punish every attempt at corruption. As we should have an honest government, so we should have a pure government. I have spoken of state pride. More than once I have been made to blush when away from home to hear the charge that the elections in Indiana were sometimes corrupt. I trust I may entertain the hope that there is exaggeration in this, and that our errors of the past no longer exist. It is a sure sign of national decay in a Republican government when the fountainhead of power, the ballot, becomes corrupt. While we must have an honest and pure government to ensure the perpetuation of our institutions, we should also have an efficient government. And this, I think, can best be brought about by the universal application of the system of competitive civil service. I know that many an Indiana politician has mocked at it as the dream of the idealist but it is the only democratic method of filling the offices where all applicants stand on a common level, and the only way of securing the best results in administration. I have entered upon a fruitful theme, but must not pursue it further. I have suggested three points which seem appropriate for our consideration today, when we are gathered to honor the soldiers who died that our country might live. We owe it to them to so act as citizens that they shall not have offered up their lives in vain. Let us cherish their memory, and in our day and generation do what we can to perpetuate for the people of the ages to come the blessings of free institutions among men. Should we thus prove true to our trust, this imposing memorial, so patriotic in design and so perfect in execution, will stand in the future years as a testimonial, not only to the fallen heroes of the war, but also to the faithful citizens, who handed down, unimpaired, their heritage of Republican government to mankind. Military Service of John W. Foster War Department, the Adjutant General's Office Statement of the Military Service of John W. Foster Lieutenant Colonel, 25th Regiment, Indiana Volunteer Infantry, and Colonel, 65th and 136th Regiments, Indiana Volunteer Infantry. The records show that John W. Foster was mustered into service August 19, 1861, as Major, 25th Indiana Volunteer Infantry, to serve three years. He was subsequently commissioned lieutenant colonel of the regiment and is recognized by the War Department as having been in the military service of the United States as of that grade and organization from April 30, 1862. He was mustered out of service as lieutenant colonel to date August 24, 1862, to accept promotion. He was mustered into service as colonel, 65th Indiana Volunteer Infantry, to date August 24, 1862, to serve three years. He was in command of the District of Western Kentucky, Department of Ohio, with headquarters at Henderson, Kentucky, in October and November, 1862, and in March, April, and May, 1863. But the records do not show either the date on which he assumed command or the date from which he was relieved therefrom. From August 21, 1863, to September 5, 1863, and from September 7, 1863, to October 18, 
1863, he was in command of the 2nd Brigade, 4th Division, 23rd Army Corps. The designation of the brigade was changed to the 4th Brigade, same division, October 18, 1863. Colonel Foster remained in command to November 3, 1863. This brigade was assigned to the 2nd Division, Cavalry Corps, Army of the Ohio, November 3, 1863, and Colonel Foster commanded the 2nd Brigade of that division from November 3 to November 1863. He commanded the 2nd Division, Cavalry Corps, Army of the Ohio, from November 1863 to January 1864, exact dates not shown. He was honorably discharged March 12, 1864, as colonel, upon tender of resignation. The records further show that John W. Foster was mustered into service as colonel, 136th Indiana Volunteer Infantry, May 23, 1864, to serve 100 days, and that he was mustered out of service with the regiment as colonel, September 2, 1864, at Indianapolis, Indiana. In the operations February 12 through 16, 1862, resulting in the capture of Fort Donelson, Tennessee, Major Foster was commended by his brigade commander for, quote, the fearless and energetic manner, end quote, in which he discharged his duties. His conduct was said to be, quote, worthy of the highest commendation, end quote. At the Battle of Pittsburgh Landing, Tennessee, April 6 and 7, 1862, the command of his regiment devolved upon Major Foster on the first day. The brigade commander, in his official report of that battle, stated with reference to Major Foster as follows, quote, The command devolved on Major Foster, who proved himself in every way worthy of it. He was active, brave, and energetic, inspiring his men with courage and confidence. His worthy example was felt by all around him. End quote. Official statement furnished to Honorable John W. Foster, 1323 18th Street, Northwest, Washington, D.C., October 13, 1915. By authority of the Secretary of War, P.C. Marth, Adjutant General, in charge of office. End of Appendix Recording by Ron Broach End of War Stories for My Grandchildren by John Watson Foster